I'm Doug Jensen, and welcome to chapter one of my wildlife cinematography masterclass. Now, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things to do is to grab one of my cameras, a couple of lenses, a tripod, and go out and film wildlife for a few hours in the evening, on a weekend, or even for a few days in a row if I have the time. In fact, a trip to Yellowstone, a nice state park, a wildlife refuge, or anywhere I can expect to find abundant wildlife is my idea of a perfect vacation. The fewer human beings I see in one of my little expeditions, the better. Now, every time I go out shooting, it's different. Even if I'm returning to the same location, I've been to a dozen times before. The lighting is different, the weather is different, and the wildlife I encounter is absolutely different. And since I can't tell the wild animals where to go or what to do, I make the best of the situation I've been given. I try to put myself in the right spot with the best possible foreground and background at the best possible time of day with the right camera gear and then wait patiently to see if I'll be rewarded with a special moment where everything comes together. Now sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't, but I think it is the variety and randomness of filming wildlife that actually keeps it fresh and challenging. I suppose it's a cliche to say that I'm hunting with my camera, but that's really what it is. The main difference being that all the animals live to see another day, and if all goes well, I'll return home with some great video to post online for family and friends, or just to enjoy watching on my big screen TV in the living room. What I do with the footage I shoot is far less important to me than the actual experience of shooting it. And if you're an experienced wildlife photographer, I'll bet you know exactly what I mean when I say that. It's the chase that keeps us interested. In fact, I think photographing or filming wildlife is perhaps one of the most challenging yet rewarding hobbies you can take up. And you don't need to travel to far away exotic locations or own a super expensive camera to enjoy filming wildlife. Common animals that are filmed well are much more interesting to watch than rare animals that have been filmed poorly. The idea for this masterclass started rattling around the back of my mind a couple of years ago when I ran into some serious amateur photographers out in the field who saw me shooting video and asked me for some pointers. They told me they had tried shooting video with their DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, but they didn't get the results they had hoped for, so they had gone back to shooting stills. It was clear to me after talking to them about their camera settings and shooting techniques that they didn't fully appreciate how different it is to shoot video instead of stills. Now granted, there is a lot of overlap between still photography and video, but as we go through the rest of this masterclass, I think you'll be surprised at just how many differences there really are. During the last 15 years, I've written a number of field guides for Sony cameras, produced quite a few in-depth masterclass training videos, and taught dozens of hands-on workshops to help fellow professionals in the television video production industry improve their skills. But this is a different kind of masterclass because it's geared more towards having fun, challenging yourself to learn new skills, and learning how to shoot some awesome wildlife video regardless of where you live or travel. Now, if you're watching this video, there's a good chance you might already have a strong background in wildlife photography, but are just now thinking about getting started in video. Or you might be very experienced in video production, but are now just discovering the pleasure of getting out into nature and filming wildlife. Either way, my goal with this workshop is to help you fill in the gaps in your knowledge, reinforce the things you might already be doing right, and show you how to get better results every time you go out to film wildlife. In a nutshell, this masterclass is as close to a one-on-one -on -one workshop as I can create without us actually being in the same room together, or I should say, standing side by side out in the forest or a meadow. When a magnificent bald eagle flies over your head, you need to be prepared with the right camera the right exposure and focus settings, the right lens, the right tripod, and excellent shooting skills, or the shot will be missed. Wildlife cinematography can be quite stressful as you race against the clock to get the perfect shot before the moment passes. Sometimes a few seconds will make all the difference in the world. And you know what? I think that pressure is also one of the things that makes filming wildlife fun. If it was easy, where would be the challenge? Now from the outset, I wanna make it clear that I am not a full-time wildlife cinematographer. Although I am a professional television cameraman, and I'm lucky enough to have some of my nature footage featured occasionally on the CBS News Sunday morning show, and I earn a nice steady income from my portfolio of wildlife stock footage, filming wildlife is simply not something I care to pursue on a full-time basis. I prefer having a variety of different kinds of assignments to work on, from news magazine shows like 60 Minutes and Dateline, to sports productions like the Olympics, the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball, plus documentaries, reality TV shows, and corporate productions. I love having a variety of different types of work in my professional life, and I think the joy I get from filming wildlife would evaporate if that was my full-time job. 
Believe it or not, there are just a handful of full-time professional cameramen and women in the entire world who make their living filming wildlife. It takes a special kind of person who can devote days or weeks to camping out in the jungle or hiking to the top of a mountain in search of some elusive wild animal and then waiting patiently for just the right moment to get the perfect shot. Now, I have nothing but the utmost respect and admiration for the people who do that, but again, that's not for me. And it may not be for you either because we all have our day jobs, right? Most of the people I meet out in the field who have professional camera gear turn out to be hobbyists. Their day jobs are doctors, dentists, lawyers, accountants, educators, business owners, or other normal careers that have nothing whatsoever to do with photography or video. Even on the rare occasions when I do run into a professional photographer, it invariably turns out that person makes their living shooting subjects entirely unrelated to wildlife, such as weddings, portraits, or commercial photography. Like me, they're just out shooting wildlife because they enjoy it, and whatever financial gains they may make from it is just a bonus. Now, it might surprise you to hear that I'm an outlier amongst my colleagues in the television business. I'd say that less than 2% of the cameramen and women that I work with ever goes out and shoots wildlife or nature just for the fun of it. To most of them, television video production is just a job, and as surprising as it sounds, they don't seem to have any desire to get out and shoot for the fun of it. Well, this masterclass has not been made for people like that. It has been made for people like you, someone who already has a passion for wildlife photography or video production in general and is now ready to spread their wings and learn how to capture professional quality wildlife video. Not only is filming wildlife arguably more challenging than taking still photographs, it also creates content that is more interesting to share with friends and family because video is a much more immersive experience for your audience. While a photograph tries to tell a whole story in an instant, video tells its story in the fourth dimension, time. Most people prefer watching videos because videos have action, sound, and usually convey a more complete story about an animal's behavior and their habitat than just a single photo. Now, I don't mean to minimize the importance of photographs or to imply that excellent wildlife photos are easy to shoot. I'm sure you'd agree that nothing could be further from the truth. But nevertheless, there's no denying that the modern world revolves more around video content than photos. That is just a fact. In the past, there was a clear distinction between professionals and amateurs, because amateurs couldn't afford the necessary high-end cameras that were required to get professional caliber footage. But that's not true anymore. The cost of professional cameras and lenses that are fully capable of shooting great looking video, as good as anything you'll see in a high-end television wildlife documentary, are now within the grasp of anyone who is serious about filming wildlife. 20 years ago, a standard definition beta cam cost over $60,000 just for the body, plus another $25,000 for the lens. Today, you can get a beautiful 4K full-frame mirrorless camera with an excellent 600mm telephoto lens for under $5,000. That is truly amazing. And speaking of Betacam, a 30-minute standard definition videotape used to cost about $25 and could only be used once or twice. Plus, you had to factor in the cost of a deck to play back those tapes for editing, and the price of those professional VCRs ran into the tens of thousands of dollars. But today, I can record more than two hours of high-quality 4K video on a tiny little SDXC card that costs less than 100 bucks, and it can be used over and over again. Plus, I can ingest all that footage from this card into my computer in a matter of minutes with a cheap $10 card reader. DaVinci Resolve, the world's leading color grading software, and something that is just as essential for processing video as Lightroom is for processing photos, used to cost $250,000 to $800,000, depending on the configuration. Today, Resolve is 10 times more powerful than it was back in 2009 when Blackmagic acquired it, and now it is basically free. The point I'm making is that these are extraordinary times we're living in, where the cost of entry into professional quality wildlife video production has dropped to the point where it is easily within the reach of anyone who is serious about jumping in and giving it a try. But ironically, while the cost of professional video equipment and software has plummeted, the learning curve to master the use of that equipment has become steeper because today's cameras have an ever-expanding list of features and capabilities that were unimaginable a few years ago. The days of just turning on the camera and pressing the record button are long gone, if they ever existed at all. In addition to owning the right equipment, you also need to know how to set exposure for video, how to smoothly track focus on fast moving wildlife with no jerky movements, and how composing properly for video is often different than composing for photos. 
above and beyond technical proficiency with your gear, you also need to know how to find wildlife, where to position yourself for the best light, how to get close enough to animals to ensure great images, how to stay safe, and how to behave in an ethical manner. And finally, just as you currently use software such as Lightroom or Photoshop to process your photos, you're going to need to learn how to color grade your video clips. No matter what camera settings you choose, every clip can be and must be processed in post if you want to take your work to a higher level. The great photographer Ansel Adams once said, the negative is equivalent to the composer's score and the print is the performance. That is just as true now as it was decades ago when he said it. In today's digital darkroom, we must take the original footage we captured in the field and process it in post to make the final work into something even better than it was when it was shot. That is especially important if you have any aspirations of selling your best work as stock footage. Now, personally, I have thousands of wildlife clips that have earned money for me, dozens that have earned well over $1,000 a piece, and a handful that have earned more than $5,000 each. So yes, the potential to earn some decent money from wildlife video definitely exists, more than enough to justify the camera gear and cover travel expenses. If you happen to be interested in selling your work as stock footage, I already have a five-hour masterclass devoted entirely to that topic. So in this workshop, we're going to stay focused on the nuts and bolts of shooting excellent wildlife video without any regard to what will be done with it after it's been shot and processed in post. As I already said, money isn't my main motivator anyway. I really enjoy the challenge of locating wildlife and then shooting the very best footage possible within the constraints that my time, equipment, and location will allow. Fortunately, you don't have to be a professional wildlife cinematographer to get great results. Now, if you really want to ensure that this workshop is successful for you, I need you to do one thing. Please keep an open mind. Some of the things I'm going to teach you might seem completely out of sync with your preconceived notions of how video should be shot. And your knee-jerk reaction might be to say, well, that's not how I do it, or that's not what some YouTuber says how to do it, or my personal favorite, I don't care what you say, I like the way my footage looks, and that's all that matters to me. Well, there is some truth to that statement because ultimately it's up to each one of us to critique our own work and decide for ourselves what looks good and what does not. But if you want your footage to be admired by others, if you want your footage to look like it came right out of a big budget wildlife documentary, and if you ever want to make money by selling your best work as stock footage, then it must, at a minimum, conform to certain technical standards and aesthetic norms. Now, I'm not saying that everything I say should be taken as gospel or that my way is the only way of getting the job done. I'll admit that I tend to speak in terms of absolutes. You must do this or you must do that. But obviously, there are possible exceptions to almost every piece of advice I'll share throughout this class. So please don't get too hung up on thinking about those rare exceptions when my rules may not apply or when my advice doesn't fit the situation. All I'm asking is that you keep an open mind. Listen to what I have to say, try putting my suggestions into practice, and then you can decide whether to follow my lead or do something different that feels better to you. Now, probably two of the biggest questions you have right now are, what kind of camera do I need to film wildlife? And is my current camera good enough? To answer those questions, let's first talk about our goals. What do you want to film? Wildlife cinematography covers a wide range of subjects, and some things are going to be much harder to film than others. Some animals will allow you to get very close to them, while other animals must be filmed from a long distance. Some subjects are stationary for much of the time, making them easy to film, while other animals move at great speed, often going from standing completely still to flying or running in the blink of an eye. Are you content with letting animals just exit the frame whenever they suddenly decide to move? Or do you want to be able to follow wildlife with smooth camera movement and precise focus tracking? After all, video is mostly about movement and action. Without it, you might as well be taking photos and putting together a slideshow. If you're satisfied filming a wide shot of birds on a pond, you can do that with your cell phone. But that is not what this workshop is about. If you want to shoot extreme close-ups of slow-moving bugs in your garden, you'll need a special macro lens. But that is not a topic covered in this masterclass either. If you want to aim your camera at a stationary animal, zoom all the way in and hope it doesn't decide to move out of frame before you've gotten your shot, you can do that easily enough with a point and shoot camera and a $50 tripod. But that's not much different than just taking a snapshot, is it? And that's not what this workshop is about either. So what is this workshop about? Well, it ought to be fairly obvious from the footage I've been showing so far. This workshop is primarily about venturing out to locations where we'll have a good chance of finding interesting wildlife and then getting up close to those animals and capturing their behavior, their movements, 
their habitat, and sometimes, if we're lucky, their interaction with other wildlife. This workshop is about learning to shoot beautiful cinematic footage that goes beyond just documenting wildlife. That's where the creative and artistic element of wildlife shooting really comes into play. I don't want you to settle for this if you can have this instead. I don't want you to settle for this if you can have this instead. I don't want you to settle for this if you can have this instead. I want you to be able to set up your camera in a matter of seconds and capture some amazing video before the critical moment passes. Speed is of the essence when you're filming wildlife because you can't just suddenly raise your camera up to your eye and fire off a burst of raw photos. It should come as no surprise that some cameras are better suited for filming wildlife than others. So in chapter three, we'll take a look at the pros and cons of different types of cameras and learn which features and functions are vitally important and which ones are not. However, with that said, this masterclass should not be mistaken as a camera buying guide. I'm not gonna tell you which camera you should buy. I think it's far more useful for me to focus on the specifications, features, and attributes that you should be looking for when you're choosing a camera to film wildlife. Once you have that knowledge under your belt, you'll be better able to evaluate, compare cameras on your own, not only today, but also in the future, without relying solely on someone else's opinion. Personally, I own a $100,000 Sony Z750 camera package and a $70,000 Sony F55 package that are both excellent cameras for filming wildlife. But here's the thing, I don't use either one of them very much for wildlife anymore because the latest generation of cameras from Sony, Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, and other brands are smaller, lighter, less expensive, better in low light, can shoot at higher frame rates, and they have amazing autofocus capabilities. In chapter four, we'll take a deep dive into the world of telephoto lenses. And then I have an entire chapter devoted just to choosing, setting up, balancing, and operating tripods. From there, we'll take a not too technical look at video formats. We'll go over my recommended camera settings. We'll cover the unique challenges of setting exposure for video. Then we'll cover both autofocus and manual focus settings and techniques, slow motion, picture cache, audio, preparing for a shoot, where and when to film wildlife, choosing the best shooting angles once you get there, composition for video, tracking action smoothly with an emphasis on birds in flight, and then we'll finish up with four chapters, totally more than an hour and a half, just on processing your footage in post so that it looks better than reality. But before we tackle those topics, I first want to discuss the major differences between taking still photographs and shooting video. It's important that you know where the similarities lie and where there are some key differences. And that is the subject of chapter two.